Now the next thing we're going to hear about is storing data for millennia. Now there's been a massive expansion of data into all aspects of business, academia and our personal lives. We generate a huge amount of data and there's an urgent need for long-term data storage that's sustainable, resilient and cost-effective. Today, the magnetic technologies that we're using, like hard disk drives and tape, provide our most cost-effective storage. However, they have a limited lifetime. They don't provide that longevity and durability that you really require for long-term uh, long archival storage. In fact, people often joke that primitive peoples had better success with cave paintings and hieroglyphics than we have storing content for the future. We need a fundamental rethinking of storage systems and the technologies that underpin them. And we think that glass is the ideal media for such a technology. In this next session, we're going to get an update on Project Silica, the world's first glass-based storage system. Jan Stefanovacci, a principal researcher in Cloud Systems Futures at Microsoft Research Cambridge, is going to tell us all about Project Silica and the vision for what a storage system built on top of glass could look like. So over to you. Hello, my name is Jan Stefanovic. I'm a researcher here at Microsoft uh, Research Cambridge. And today I'm going to tell you about uh, the journey we've been on for the past six years on Project Silica. And I'm going to show you what we believe at Microsoft Research the future of archival storage will look like. Over the past few decades, our lives have become and continue to become increasingly digital. As our species and capabilities continues to grow, we continue to generate large amounts of high value data, including uh, personal photos and videos, uh, medical data, financial and industrial data, scientific data, and so much more. In fact, it's estimated that by 2025, we will generate upwards of 175 zettabytes of data every year between the cloud and all of the edge devices that we have. Now, of course, a lot of this data will be ephemeral, but much of it is actually essential to the preservation of our collective output and identity as a species, as well as our personal histories as individuals, our personal uh, our videos and photos. And as humanity continues to evolve and grow, our need for long-term storage will only continue to increase. Unfortunately, despite this need, we still do not have a storage technology that offers us sustainable and cost-effective long-term storage for archival data. The most cost-effective technologies today are magnetic ones like hard disk drives and tape, with tape offering us the lowest dollar per terabyte uh, cost. Unfortunately, the problem with magnetic media is that it has a limited lifetime and it actually degrades over time, which leads to a few problems. First is that every few years because of this, we need to copy the data onto a new generation of the physical media in order to ensure that our uh, data will be safe long term. For hard disk drives, this is on the order of about five years. For tapes, even though they have an advertised lifetime of about 20 years, uh, industry pressures like the lack of backwards compatibility between tape generations shortens this time span to around 10 years or so. In addition to that, those of you who are familiar with uh, storage systems will know that most storage systems that, have, uh, that employ magnetic media require energy to be spent in order to scrub the data. That is to periodically read the data back, make sure it's safe in the presence of media degradation, and use techniques like erasure coding and error correction in order to um, ensure that the data has the same degree of uh, durability as it had at the beginning uh, when it was written. Now the consequence of this, unfortunately, is that the uh, emissions and energy and the cost to store uh, long-time archival data now scales with the lifetime of the data for magnetic technologies. So with tape and hard disk drives, we need to keep paying the cost. We need to be keep paying a cost consistently over time in order to keep the data around. Now at Microsoft Research, we've spent the last six years thinking about how to build the best long-term archival storage technology. And we believe the solution to this is glass storage in the cloud. Why glass? Glass is a low cost media. It's very durable. It's chemically inert, which means it's very stable over a long uh, period of time. It's not susceptible to electromagnetic interference from things like magnets, EMPs, solar flares. It's a warm media, which means it's impossible to overwrite, even by accident um, or in the presence of uh, bugs or firmware bugs or malicious intent. And it offers lifetimes for the data of upwards of tens to hundreds of thousands of years. 
This makes it a truly sustainable media. It means that we can, once we write the data, we can leave it in situ forever and break this cycle of having to refresh the data every few years between different generations of the same uh, magnetic media. Why the cloud? Well, the cloud really has two properties that um, make it ideal, uh, make it the ideal place to deploy such a technology. Microsoft Azure alone has hundreds of data centers around the globe, and we multiplex many customer workloads over the resources deployed. This means that we can uh, run these workloads as efficiently as possible and extract and maximize the utilization of the resources deployed and then offer the cost savings back to our customers. This means that Microsoft Azure already has the scale to commoditize and lower the cost of a completely new storage technology like Silica and deploy it uh, at scale. The geodistribution aspect also means that we can offer the same kinds of uh, availability guarantees for archival storage as existing uh, cloud storage systems today. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to take you on the journey we've been on for the past six years, and I'm going to answer the question, how do we build the world's first archival storage system underpinned by glass? I'm going to show you how we write the data, I'm going to show you how we read and decode the data, I'm going to show you how the whole system comes together with the Silica Glass Library, and I'm going to talk a bit about durability and availability in the system. Now we started this project around six years ago as a collaboration with the University of Southampton. And the first time we visited them, they were writing a few bits at a time under uh, a laser. They were moving the piece of glass physically to another corner of the room, sticking it under a manual microscope, reading a few bits at a time out. Nonetheless, we were very excited at the potential that the technology uh, promised. And over the last six years, we've really tried to focus on how do we take this from experiments in the lab to really developing this as a large-scale storage technology that we can deploy in the cloud. How do, we do how do we scale the throughput? How do we scale the density to the point where it makes sense economically? And how do we design and build a system that truly operates, uh, that, that is truly cloud-first and operates uh, at scale? Roughly, I'm going to show you a day in the life of a silica glass platter and beyond. So to write the data, we use a femtosecond laser. In fact, we use a femtosecond pulse laser. When people think of lasers, typically they think of continuous wave lasers that um, operate continuously. Pulse lasers deliver an incredibly high power pulse in a very short amount of time. A femtosecond is on the order of 10 to the minus 15 seconds, so incredibly short pulse. And what we do is we focus that laser pulse inside the bulk of the glass media. So we don't write the data on the surface, we write it inside the bulk of the glass media. And at the point of focus, when the laser fires, we get these nanoscale structures called voxels. In this image, you can see four uh, of these voxels under a scanning electron microscope. And what we can do is by changing the polarization of the right beam, during when we write, so by changing the orientation of the electric field of the right beam, we can determine the orientation that these voxels end up having in the glass. So we can literally rotate them in the glass. And by doing this, we can actually encode multiple bits of data in each voxel. Now, we write many, many voxels at a time. In fact, on the right side, you can see uh, a sector made up of over, uh, we, we can write over 100,000 uh, voxels in each of these sectors. But the right geometry is actually optimized for subsequent reading. So I'll show you in a second. To read, we actually read 2D sectors of voxels all at once. And so this is how we write uh, individual voxels. But how do we really achieve the throughputs that we need uh, to really have a, uh, a real uh, storage technology at scale. Now you might think that because we're an optical technology, we spin the media. But this actually isn't true. Spinning media is very difficult. It's very difficult to spin up, it takes time, and it's very difficult to stabilize at very high RPMs. So we've made a deliberate decision to engineer as much complexity out of the system, and instead we've chosen to move the light instead. To achieve high throughputs in the system, we use beam steering technologies to scan the laser beam across the media. Using this uh, technique, we're able to achieve aggregate system level throughputs comparable to existing tape archive deployments. And you can see we can write many voxels at a time and we can write many layers volumetrically. In fact, we can write over 200 layers in most of the samples, in all of the samples that we write today. Now in terms of density, 
we've achieved raw, that is pre-error correction volumetric densities that are much higher than LT09 tapes. That's the latest generation of magnetic tape. To put into perspective, you can imagine a two millimeter thick square piece of glass the size of a DVD holding upwards of seven terabytes of data. And we, in fact, we've actually stopped pushing on density uh, a year ago and we've actually shifted our attention to improving the throughput in the system. So there's still a long uh, roadmap to go on scaling density to technology. Now in silica, we actually use different uh, technologies to write and to read the media. Of course, we don't write blind. We actively monitor and control the write process, but we want to have the guarantee that um, after we've written a, a piece of glass, that it's readable and that the data is durable using the technology that we're going to use uh, to read the data long term. Now to read the data, we use a lower cost technology. We use polarization sensitive microscopy. The illumination for this is regular light, which means it's actually impossible to overwrite the data since the, uh, the, the light does not have enough peak power to overwrite any of the structures inside uh, the glass. And in order to read, what we do is we focus the read head inside the bulk of uh, the glass media at the layer that we're interested in reading and we read the entire 2D sector worth of voxels. And what we're doing is we're actually, uh, we're actually shining light with a known polarization inside the glass and we're measuring what change in polarization that those voxels impart on that light uh, depending on their orientation inside uh, the glass. Now in order to do a verify operation, we effectively start reading the platter at one corner and then at the other corner. And so we've effectively verified that we can read all of the data back from the glass before we actually flush it from an upper level tier in which we cache it uh, to write. Now to decode the data, we use machine learning. We use a fully convolutional neural network developed here in-house at Microsoft Research Cambridge. It's a variant of the unit architecture with some custom layers that are specific to our problem. And for every sector, we take several images uh, that characterize these polarization, fully characterize these polarization changes. We feed them into the network and we actually get probability distributions for the entire sector all at once. So we get a 2D, uh, a 2D matrix of probability distributions for every single voxel, which then get, gets fed into the error correction that I'm going to talk about, about uh, later in the system. Now, a nice property of this, of course, is that since we're decoding 2D sectors at a time, as we increase the density of the media, we're also getting throughput increases for free. Now, a big advantage of technology compared to alternatives, particularly tape, is that we can offer fast on-demand customer reads. We don't need to wait for the media to spool or to spin up and stabilize. We can simply load the media into the reader. We can seek to the particular XY location that we care about, read just the data that we uh, want, and then eject the media and move on to the next platter. So I've told you about readers and writers in the system. Now I want to switch gears and talk about the silica library and how we put it all together to build the real system that's going to be deployed in a data center. But before we do that, I want to take a step back and just walk you through a bit about archival storage design. So this is a picture of um, a Prague, an actual physical archive in Prague in 1937. And you can see the kind of picking mechanisms it had. They had a fixed gantry system in the middle with a small number of pickers. In this case, the pickers were actually humans. And these pickers could not pass each other, and they could only access the data, uh, the, the, the platters that were uh, right in front of them at any given time. In 2022, uh, IBM tape library systems follow more or less the same design. You have a fixed gantry system with a small number of fixed uh, picking mechanisms, in this case two robots, one for failover, only one is in use at a time, that cannot move past each other, and they can only access media along a wall. So I just want to really highlight the lack of innovation in the archival space in almost a century now. The net effect of this is very clear when you actually study the performance of tape systems today. Now in building the silica glass library, we followed a clean slate design approach. We wanted to come up with the best system to offer sustainable long-term storage in the cloud. We extensively studied Microsoft's uh, tape workloads today to figure out what are the pain points of existing archival systems and to build a novel robotics design that obviates these pain points. We found a few interesting insights that actually go against the grain of conventional wisdom about uh, what archive workloads look like. The reads are actually predominantly small. When most people think of archive workloads, they think of you know, multi-terabyte reads, your database has gone down, you need to restore everything from the last checkpoint that you had, but actually 
most customer workloads, uh, most customer reads that we see are actually quite small. In addition to that, the data temperature actually decreases over time. So if you look at the access rate of the data compared to the total amount of data stored in the system, the temperature or the, the access rate actually decreases over time, which means that these systems tend to get colder over time. And we also see, as expected in the cloud, very high variability across archive deployments in things like uh, access rates, temperature, and um, which means that it's very difficult to come up with a one-size-fit-all solution for this. Now, combined with the properties of the core technology, we came up with a set of uh, core design principles that we wanted to follow in building the Silica Glass library. One is that the library lifetime should really match the lifetime of the data center building. When you have a media that lasts effectively forever, you don't want to have to copy the data over or to do any sort of physical movement while the data center building is still uh, commissioned. The second is we want this property called air gap by design. So this goes a step further from the worm property. We want to make it physically impossible to overwrite or corrupt the media, even in the presence of malware or any sort of unintended software behavior. Um, and from speaking to existing archival uh, storage users, we know that this is actually a big pain point in today's systems. When large uh, archival installations have to do this refresh cycle, they actually end up losing a lot of data because of things like malware or uh, software bugs or firmware bugs that ends up corrupting their data just while they're uh, copying it from one media to another. We also want to minimize the mechanical latency in the system. This is particularly important as we've seen that reads are predominantly small, which means that we want to minimize the amount of time physical media spent in transit being moved around or loaded into the reader so that we can get as much media through and get as through as many of these small reads as we can. Lastly, we really want a modular design that offers deployment flexibility. And this is particularly important as we've seen very high variance across different deployments. So different uh, silica libraries will need to have a different amount of hardware uh, deployed. And um, we've seen that data temperatures decrease over time, which means that the system will need to evolve along with the workload over time if we want to stay energy proportional. So the first part of the silica library are the media storage panels. These are passive components. They don't require any electricity to power, which means that we can leave them in the building for the entire lifetime of the data center. They're incrementally deployable, which means that we can deploy rack scale submodules and then connect them together to get one of these long uh, media storage panels. And we actually store the raw media in them. That, mean, that is, there's no storage cartridges like tape. We just simply put the glass in the shelf, which minimizes the amount of materials and energy that we spend on the components of the library. And we achieve this air gap by design property by um, only allowing already written platters to come into the glass library. That is, it is physically impossible to take any piece of glass that already contains data and feed it back into a writer. We can only take existing media and feed them into readers, which means that it's literally impossible to overwrite uh, a piece of glass once it's in the library. Now the next question is how do we move the glass around? Well, we've designed these robots that we call shuttles. These robots can move horizontally across rails in the uh, storage panels, but they can also move across rails using a motion that we call crabbing, which you just saw here. They can also pick uh, platters. They have a platter picker on the right side, which we can use to deliver platters between storage shelf and readers over time. An important property is that they're actually free roaming across the library shelf. So because they can do this crabbing motion, they can actually move between the rails, which means we get all to all addressability between all the robots and the glass platters. And I'm gonna come back to this uh, at the end of the talk. Now in this particular video, you're actually seeing a prototype of uh, one of these shuttles in action. This particular one does not have a picker, so it cannot pick pieces of glass, but rather it's focused on demonstrating and improving the crabbing mechanism that I showed you. So you just saw it unhooking from the top rail, hooking onto the bottom rail, and now moving off uh, into the distance. Next, I wanna talk about the segregation in the silica system. One of the biggest problems in the cloud is stranded resources. These are resources which have been manufactured, deployed, but from which we're getting very limited or no value. This tends to happen when the unit of deployment of a set of components doesn't match the way in which those components need to scale in order to best match the needs of the workload. Stranded resources are effectively wasted, which increases the cost and the emissions of the system over time. 
Now, a key property of silica is that the media has virtually unlimited lifetime, which means that it just does not make sense to package it together along with the read and the write heads. Readers and writers have electronic components, which need to get serviced and replaced over time, while the media is virtually unlimited. Now, a principal goal we wanted to achieve in the system is right sizing. That is, we want the resources in the system to match the workload uh, demand over time, while, minim while maximizing the utilization of those resources. And we know this is particularly important as archival data temperature tends to decrease over time. This means that tape-like designs, where we have the read and the write heads uh, packaged together in the drive and the media uh, separate, also don't make sense since the readers and writers need to be provisioned together. So they need to be provisioned for the peak of both the read and the write rate. While studying uh, archival systems, we know that these rates are vastly different and they tend to change over time, which means that co-locating uh, co uh, readers and writers um, are, is just a bad idea. So we took a step back and we realized that actually the read and the write technologies in silica is a great opportunity. We can uh, design and deploy readers and writer writers separately based on demand and scale the amount of readers and writers in the system that we have uh, separately. The writers, the number of writers should correspond to the ingress rate into the storage system and the number of readers should correspond to the workload demand over time. And we can project both of these through workload forecasting. The media is deployed incrementally into the system. So as new data comes into the system, uh, new media gets written. The uh, media storage shelves that I showed you keep growing and the uh, media keep, uh, keeps getting added uh, to the library. Finally, we're designing the read and the write software stacks as elastic cloud services. So these provide functionality like erasure coding, encoding of the data, and layout of the data. You remember I was saying that at write time, we actually optimize the data layout for subsequent reading. Um, things like imaging and MLD code. All of these are uh, built as elastic cloud services. And there's many benefits to doing this. One is we get the best choice of hardware possible to run the particular compute. For example, we can use the latest generation of machine learning inference hardware to do the decode. It means that we can also multiplex uh, many libraries' uh, compute requirements over time, which means we can maximize the utilization of the silicon that we're using. So over time, a silica storage system will grow by having new media panels added to them, each of which will have a different number of readers, writers, and shuttles based on the demands of the workload at that particular time. Now finally, silica needs to be a durable and reliable storage technology with high availability. In terms of failures, readers and writers have a similar failure model to today's systems, and more units can be deployed while the malfunctioning ones are getting serviced without impacting the functioning of the entire system. Um, library shuttle failures can at most temporarily block several glass platters in the system. And of course, the solution to this is crabbing. The fact that we have all-to-all -all addressability between every shuttle and every glass platter in the system means that in the presence of a uh, library shuttle stuck, stuck on a rail, um, other shuttles can come and pick up pieces of glass along uh, that row uh, until the shuttle is uh, serviced. In terms of error correction, we actually have three levels of protection. Per sector, we have low density parity check codes, or LDPC, plus checksums for integrity. The failure mode these are intended to protect against are um, random errors in the raw decode. So just like existing storage technologies have spurious errors in the read, because the read process is stochastic in silica, we also get uh, occasionally spurious reads, which we fix the same way existing storage systems do with LDPC. And we have two other layers of erasure coding, cross-sector to protect against cases when uh, LDPC has failed or we cannot guarantee integrity, and cross-platter in the rare instances when a shuttle might temporarily be blocking uh, a piece of glass that we're interested in reading. In that case, other shuttles can fetch pl platters that are part of the same coding set, and we can actually reconstruct the data that we're interested in reading. Now, it turns out we actually don't use uh, traditional storage system erasure coding. We actually use uh, code that we developed uh, in-house here at Microsoft Research Cambridge based on network coding. And network coding is a bit of a blast from the past. It was, there was some work here in our lab around 10, 15 years ago on peer-to-peer -peer networks 
and content distribution in peer-to-peer -peer networks. And it turns out that the worm property of our media makes it really amenable for a network coding based uh, erasure code. It allows us to perform much quicker reconstructions with fewer reads than you can with traditional storage system erasure codes. All in all, we're able to get total overheads that are much lower than today's tape storage system using these three levels of protection. So I showed you how we at Microsoft Research believe sustainable archival storage systems should be built. And I really believe that this is what fetching your old photos will look like in the future. Thank you.